Welcome to Providence St. Joseph's Medical Center. My name is Patrice Hallett, uh, and I'm the Director of Neuro Ortho and Rehab Services. Um, and it's my honor tonight to welcome you and to introduce our, um, our speaker, Dr. Shahan Yakubian. Dr. Yakubian received his medical degree from Penn State University College of Medicine. He completed both his internship and residency in orthopedic surgery at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. He also completed a fellowship in adult reconstructive and joint replacement surgery at Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Massachusetts. Dr. Yakubian's fellowship training allows him to care for a full spectrum of joint disease from initial onset of cartilage degeneration to complex joint replacement surgery. He has extensive surgical experience in the care of arthritis patients using advanced operative techniques, including minimally invasive um, techniques. Dr. Kubian is, is a member of the professional staff here at Providence St. Joseph's Medical Center, and it's my honor to welcome him to the podium. Okay, thank you, Patrice. Uh, so I'm Dr. Shahan Kubian, and I am going to be talking about joint replacement surgery today. Um, should we turn the lights in the light, or everything did okay? You guys can see? Okay, great. Um, so thank you, Patrice, and thank you to St. Joe's and Providence Health System for putting this on. Uh, and thanks, everybody, here for coming. Um, when we're done, we'll open the floor up for questions. So if you can hold on to the questions till the end. Uh, and then uh, when we're done, I also have asked uh, some uh, of the implant vendors uh, to come in and uh, uh, thank them for coming in. And they've got some uh, models that you can look at and see what these uh, implants for knees and hips really look like. And also, we have uh, Fred here from St. Joe's Therapy, so uh, you guys can also speak to him at the end as well if you have any questions, you know, more specifically about therapy and things like that. So, I'm going to focus tonight on uh, speaking about hip replacements, uh, but you can feel free to ask me questions about hips and knees uh, when we're done. I thought hips would be interesting because there's a lot of kind of news uh, and things like that uh, about it these days. So. Why don't we get started? So, total hip replacement, uh, we'll talk about what is a total hip replacement, who is it for, how we do it, and exactly what's involved in being evaluated, having the surgery, and then recovering successfully from hip surgery. To put it very simply, a hip is a basically a ball and socket joint, where the ball is uh, called the femoral head, and the socket is called the acetabulum. Uh, and so what happens is when we do a hip replacement, we replace the ball with a metal prosthesis and we replace the socket again with a metal prosthesis that has some very special uh, plastic lining inside it and uh, you'll be able to see those afterwards uh, over at the vendor tables and I'll show you some pictures of that as well. So who needs a total hip replacement? The most common reason for hip replacement surgery is for arthritis and so the most common type of arthritis is called osteoarthritis, and that's degradative or wear and tear arthritis. Uh, interestingly enough, we're learning more and more that there's a definite genetic predisposition uh, to developing arthritis. And so I'll see plenty of patients who, you know, they tell me their moms or dads have had joint replacements, they've had joint replacements, some of their siblings have had joint replacements. And so there's a definite trend in certain families to develop arthritis. Uh, that's very. That's the most common type of arthritis we see. Uh, in addition, we'll see post-traumatic arthritis. Uh, that's arthritis uh, that people have had injuries. So we're seeing more and more of that as as people uh, develop injuries in their knees and their hips from sporting or uh, heavy labor. They go on to develop arthritis uh, down the road. And so what happens when you have arthritis is that the cartilage that lines the joint begins to deteriorate, and now you'll hear people tell you that they're quote unquote bone on bone. The, the result of being bone on bone or having a cartilage wear down is that it causes pain in the joint. Uh, and once you have pain, you also start to lose motion. People will complain of stiffness. And generally what happens is people start to modify their activities. Whereas before, perhaps they used to go on walks, golf, swim, hike, and were very active. They start to limit themselves so that uh, they can control the level of their pain. But eventually, 
when the arthritis gets significant enough, even at rest, you'll have pain. So, the goal of a hip replacement surgery is to relieve the pain, that's the primary goal. And the secondary goal is to restore function, you know, get people back to being active so they can do whatever it is they like to do, sit at the beach, go on vacation, play golf, what have you. Uh, this is a normal x-ray of a patient's hip. And so here's a, so you're, the patient is standing there facing you, and so I thought this would be interesting to go over. Uh, this is a right hip, that's the left hip. And so what this x-ray is demonstrating, that you've got a nice normal ball here, that's the femoral head, the ball, and then you've got a nice socket. And what you see here is that there's a nice space right between the ball and the socket, and that space is filled with normal, healthy appearing cartilage. And so this person does not have arthritis and certainly would not need a hip replacement. And here is a schematic demonstrating, the, this is the bone right here. Uh, the light blue here represents the cartilage. And you can see cartilage here on the femoral head, and then you can also see a thin layer of cartilage on the socket or the acetabulum. And between the two, there's a very thin layer of joint fluid that acts as lubrication. And so you've got a perfectly smooth surface that when it's working, uh, nothing can come close to working as well as this does, uh, what nature gave us. So this is a normal appearing hip. There we go. This is a normal appearing hip with normal cartilage. And so when people start to get arthritis, this is what's wearing out. You see this blue thin layer that this picture is trying to demonstrate this blue layer wears out, and that's what arthritis is. So this is an x-ray of one of my patients with significant arthritis in the hip, and this red circle, I put that there. Uh, what that is trying to demonstrate is the fact that there is no longer any space here, and what's happened is the joint space is worn out, and now this is bone on bone, and you can see what happens here is that this person's got some bone spurs right here, that's a bone spur, and then down here they also have some bone spurs, and this is, I would say, a pretty severely arthritic hip. And here's a little comparison for you. Again, here's what the, the normal hip looks like. Nice, healthy. You can definitely distinguish the ball and the socket. And in the arthritic hip, that space is worn out. And I would say this person is bone on bone. And just based on their x-rays, a candidate for hip replacement surgery. And again, here's another schematic. Whereas before you had nice, smooth, uh, articular cartilage, what that means is the cartilage within the joint. And this is demonstrating that that cartilage has been destroyed and uh, it, this is a source of pain. So, what happens during a hip replacement surgery? So, uh, most of the time we don't have the instructions there, like these guys here. Uh, so, um, I'll go over you know, briefly what goes on with a hip replacement surgery. So let me see if this is going to work. I had this open earlier. Here we go. So this is actually um, kind of a little animation. This comes from my website, uh, and you can you can pick up some of my, my cards afterwards, and our web address is on it. That's actually a really nice resource. We have a lot of educational information on our website. So we'll kind of go over this. This is supposed to be kind of neat with uh, some animation on it. So here's a pelvis. This is a bony skeleton of the pelvis. This is the socket right over here. This white part represents the cartilage of the hip, the femoral head. So, actually let me do this. So, here we go again. Here's the socket of the pelvis, and that's the femoral head. The yellow represents the bone down here. The white is cartilage. So when someone gets arthritis, you can see this uh, cartilage is wearing out. And when we have a, when we perform a hip replacement surgery, what you have to do is you have to enter the joint. And so you have to basically dislocate the hip where the ball has to come out of the socket. That's the first thing that we do. The next thing that we do is what this was trying to demonstrate here to you is that we have to prepare the socket. And what we do is whatever cartilage is remaining within the socket, we remove that and we prepare the socket so that we can put in a metallic implant like that just shows you right there. So this is metal and this, the way that this adheres to the bone is uh, this has a very specialized surface on it and what eventually happens is the bone will actually grow and 
adhere to the bone and will grow into the metal. And so it really becomes a part of your body. Uh, about 40, 50 years ago when hip replacement surgery was first starting, the way they used to put these implants in was by using uh, bone cement. Uh, and for many, many years, and it is still used at, at times in hip surgery, this was the gold standard. But uh, for the past 20 or so years, really people have gotten away from using the bone cement, and now we're using these you know, better metal products that allow for the bone to grow into the uh, implant. So after the socket goes in, what we do next is this model is demonstrating a little a plastic insert that goes into the socket. And next what we do is we remove the ball right here. Now in this model, this patient's getting flipped around, uh, you know, left, right, center, and right, but in fact, uh, that doesn't happen uh, during surgery, but uh, the, the surgeon is the, the one that's actually moving around. So what we do is we remove the ball like that, and we put in a metal implant that goes into the femur. And then we put in a metal ball, and now the two pieces mate together like that. And so whereas before it was you know, a hip that had bone on bone, uh, this is now a hip that has metal on highly specialized piece of plastic that's called highly cross-linked polyethylene. So the next slide, this is a model of a hip replacement. Um, and again, these are just little slides that show you what we do. Basically, you have to remove the ball, prepare the socket, and prepare the femur to accept the implant. And this is a little schematic showing you what it looks like. It's actually inside the bone. So the, the part in the femur, the femoral component, goes inside the femoral canal. It's inside the bone. A lot of patients always ask me what happens to the marrow. Uh, the marrow is removed uh, and it replenishes itself around that stem. And eventually what happens is that the bone grows and attaches right onto that stem. Uh, this is in the situation where cement is not being used, which is probably, I would say, 99.9% .9 of the time that I'm doing hip surgery, we don't use cement. I, I can't even remember the last time I used it, probably. Um, and here's an x-ray of a patient that, this is one of my patients that had a hip replacement. You can see their left hip, this hip uh, is well preserved. Oops. And this is their right hip, this shows you the implant that goes inside the femur, the femoral component, and this is the socket, and these two pieces made together. This is a, probably a 50-something year old gentleman. Uh, he's, he's very active, he surfs, uh, he goes uh, wind sailing, he, hikes, bikes, he's a very active man, he's probably about 56 years old. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of stuff out in the media about hip replacement surgery, so I'll just touch up upon uh, a few of these things. And so there's a couple ways, there's probably three different ways you can do a hip replacement. You can go in from the front, you can go in from the side, or you can go in from the back. And you'll hear about you know, an anterior approach versus a lateral approach or a posterior approach. So anterior is from the front, Posterior is from the back and lateral is from the side. And then a lot of patients will ask me about, you know, what really is minimally invasive surgery? You know, there's a lot of, you know, press and media about that all the time. So a lot of patients ask me about that. So we'll kind of touch up upon that. So here's a little uh, pictorial of the anterior, what an anterior and a posterior approach to the hip is. So the anterior approach is you can go in from the front. So imagine where your pocket is in your pants. Uh, you kind of, your front pocket, you kind of go in from that. Uh, and then the posterior approach is uh, you go, if you imagine where your back pocket is and your front pocket is, it's right kind of on the side between the two of those. So each has its advantages and each has its disadvantages. Um, no, not, one is not purely superior to the other. Uh, if one was clearly the better approach, you know, we wouldn't be having this dialogue. Uh, because everybody would be doing one and not the other. So there's people in both camps. There's certain people that do both depending on the patient. Um, and so that, so we'll talk about uh, the advantages and disadvantages of each one. So the 
both the anterior and the posterior approach have been around for many, many years. The anterior approach has gotten more recent uh, press and media. Uh, and the posterior approach has also been around for many, many years. Uh, and so what's happening is each has an advantage and each has a disadvantage. Uh, the, what I tell patients is the most important thing that you want to do when you're trying to figure out, let's say you need to have a hip surgery, is you know, as opposed to you know, trying to figure it out on your own, what you really want to do is you want to find an orthopedic surgeon that you're comfortable with, and you want to you want to trust them, and you want to let them guide you through it. Um, so the advantages of a an anterior uh, approach are that there's a possibility of a maybe a, le a little bit of a lesser rate of dislocation. What that means is after surgery, the hip coming out of the socket. Although with the newer implants that we use and better surgical technique that we use, the posterior approach, the, the chance of the hip coming out of the socket is actually about the same. So there's really not much of a huge advantage on that. Uh, as far as recovery and you know which patients do better, there's really, if you look at all the research that's been done, after a, and when they look at patients how they're doing in three months and in six months, there's really no difference to how people look doing after an anterior approach to, or after a posterior approach. So it's really your surgeon's preference is you know, how they want to do your surgery. I do a posterior approach, that's how I was trained, that's how I feel more com most comfortable. I do a minimally invasive posterior approach and we'll talk about what that means. So, you know, what is minimally invasive surgery and is it right for me? A lot of people ask me that. So, minimally invasive surgery has been really become popular, I would say, in the last six years. And really what we've learned is that, you know, classically, when people would have hip surgery, the incisions were quite large, the dissections were quite extensive, and people would uh, be limited in what they could do immediately after the surgery, and the pain management was not very good. Uh, but over the past, I'd say, six or seven years, with the push for minimally invasive surgery, where the dissections are smaller, more of the tissues are respected and preserved, and the muscles are spared during surgery. We've also been focusing on improving our pain management after surgery. And especially with hip surgery, really what we always hear from patients is that the, they oftentimes have less pain after their surgery, even on day one, than they did before their hip surgery. And so, it's a really, the hip surgery is really amazing because it is, you know, I'll have patients who are in agony. They, you know, a lot of them have let their hips go on for really for too long and they've been trying to live with it for quite some time. And uh, after they have their hip replaced, really the day after, they'll say, you know, that pain, and a lot of patients, a lot of patients will classify it as that gnawing pain in my growing is gone. And I hear that from hundreds of people. Uh, they'll have some soreness, obviously, from the surgery. You know, it's not magic, uh, but it's a, it's a, a, an amazing uh, decrease in the amount of pain immediately after the surgery. Now, the other things that we've gotten better at are, you know, using pain medications uh, in order to treat patients' pain. And so what we've also learned uh, with this big push for minimally invasive or less invasive surgery is that we can use multiple pain medications in order to help control pain. You know, whereas before patients would just get morphine essentially for pain, uh, now you know, we'll use, uh, for example, Tylenol. It's a, you know, Tylenol is a very good pain medication, but it's not enough on its own. So we'll use Tylenol, we'll use anti-inflammatories at the same time, such as a medicine called Celebrex, which you, I'm sure many of you have heard of. Uh, we'll also use uh, medications that help uh, regulate the nerves so that you're less sensitive to the pain. And then we'll also use medication pills like Percocet or Vicodin to help with the pain control. And we're becoming less and less dependent on IV pain medications uh, because with the better surgeries and better anesthesia that we're using and better pain management medications, people are doing better and better. Consequently, what this means for people is that after surgery, people are getting up and moving around much sooner. Uh, so, whereas, you know, 25 years ago, when you'd have your hip replaced, you'd be in the hospital probably about two weeks, and for the first couple of days, you might be in bed, just laying there. Uh, 
you know, now you're lucky to make it through the day without having to get up. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, we'll, you know, what we'll do is, you know, now if you have hip surgery, if you're one of the, if your surgery is in, in the morning, you know, the physical therapist will be seeing you in the afternoon or in that evening and getting you up. Uh, for, for our younger patients who are uh, physically quite fit, uh, we can have them going home the next morning. So that's, that's just to put things in perspective. You know, that's not for everybody, and that's not for, uh, that's not for every patient, and it's not, some of it has to do with age, some of it doesn't have to do with age. Uh, a lot of it has to do with health, some of it has to do with motivation, and some of it has to do with you know, the degree of the arthritis and you know, how bad somebody's hip is and how complicated their surgery is. But again, to put things in perspective, uh, I don't think 30 years ago anybody would have thought that patients would have been going home you know, 23 hours after a hip surgery. Uh, and certainly the average patient is staying in the hospital for probably about three days. That's all patients, all ages. If you look across the board, the length of stay is probably about three days. So nowhere near two weeks. Most patients after hip surgery are able to go home. So, so this is, you know, this is to help put things in perspective. So back in the old days, probably about 20 years ago, when you would have your hip replaced, you'd probably have an incision. This picture, this patient is on their side. This is their right hip, and their head is over here, and their feet are over there. And so, in the old days, your incision would be probably about this long, and maybe even a little bit longer to there. Nowadays, your incision is probably about this long. long. Uh, so when patients ask me, you know, how big is my incision going to be, I'll usually tell them it's going to be about this big. Sometimes it's about this big, sometimes it's about that big. It all depends on, you know, how bad your arthritis is. It also has to do with how your soft tissues, how mobile they are, and how easily we can move the tissues around to accommodate your surgery. So at the end of the day, the, the length of the incision is somewhat important, but it's not the most important thing. It's really... You know, the length of the incision is part of it. What we're doing inside is the other part of it. Uh, and so we we release a lot less of the tendons now. A lot less of the muscles are kind of spared during the surgery. And we're also getting better at doing the surgeries where it's, uh, it's done kind of in a very efficient and timely manner with less trauma to the tissues. And so what that allows is the less trauma there is from surgery, the less pain the person will have. And when you add in all the nuances in pain management that we have now, you know, that's a winning combination for getting people up and moving, and it's very tolerable to them. And the best thing, you know, is to basically get patients up and moving and get them home out of the hospital where they're more comfortable at home, plus chances of, you know, complications and things like that when they're comfortable. So this is just to put things in perspective as far as you know the incision length. You know we're down to about an incision about this long uh, compared to uh, these big incisions that we had in the old days. Uh, this was this I used to get this question much more frequently about <coughs> I'd say about three years ago. A lot of people would ask me about hip resurfacing, and so what hip resurfacing is is. A, um, as opposed to, in certain patients, it's a, it's a good idea. Uh, and as opposed to removing that whole ball, what you're basically doing is um, shaving the end of the bone and putting a metal cap on the, on the uh, femur. The socket is exactly the same, but what you're doing is putting a cap on the end of the femur. So if you look at this picture, you don't see that part that goes down into, oops, that goes down into the femoral canal here. Okay? Uh, but this is losing some popularity of uh, the hip resurfacing, and I'll, and I'll go into why that's the case. Uh, but in certain patients, this is not a bad surgical option, but it's, it's, it's really lost a lot of ground over the past year or so. Okay. So another very common question that I get in my office these days is a lot of now, who here has seen advertisements on TV to recall hips? Let me just ask you that. So just about everybody. Anytime I'm watching uh, a CNN in the doctor's lounge at lunchtime, I see advertisements for hip recall. So those are just a couple little things I saw on the web. So, uh, and so this is frightening for people, and so I wanted to go over this to kind of help put things in perspective. So uh, 
the, the recall that you see now is for a specific implant uh, that would have a specific designer and it was for a specific bearing surface. Okay, so whenever we talk about hip replacements, you know, one thing that's I think valuable to talk about are bearing options. And what that means is when we're talking about the ball in the socket that you can see here on this picture, the ball can be made of one type of material and the socket can be made of another type of material. And the most common one that's used right now is a metal ball, like the one that you see here, that's a metal ball, and then please feel free to look at them on the demo table back there. And then the socket is made again of this plastic. You see here in this picture this white plastic socket that's called polyethylene. The specific hip that was recalled was a metal ball similar to this with a combination of a specific metal socket, okay? And so that, that was causing some problems where the socket was not working well and it was creating some metal debris, because the metal on metal was creating metal debris around the hip, and these hips were failing at an unacceptable rate. And so that product was recalled, and unfortunately some patients had to have their uh, hips redone, okay? Uh, that was, again, with a specific designer. It's not with all hips, it's with a specific brand. It's like when Toyota called some of their Priuses, basically. Recalled some of those, you know. Didn't mean that all cars were bad. It just meant that that's partic that particular car was having some problems. So, I, you know, if I can tell you one thing, if anybody's out there that's been considering a hip replacement surgery, but has been kind of, you know, scared away from some of the advertisements they've seen on the television, it's, you know, hip replacement is very successful. It's 95% you know, good to excellent results. If you look at patients, they're very satisfied. It's one of the most consistently satisfactory surgeries that we have out there today that people are happy with. And so although this was a, you know, kind of a, a, a bad event that happened with one particular implant, it shouldn't, I hope it shouldn't you know, preclude anyone from having their hip replaced if they're considering that. But what you should know is that if you are having your hip replaced, you should talk to your doctor about, you know, what the bearing options are. And so the different types of bearing options as far as what the terminal head and the socket can be are the following. You can have the metal on the plastic like this. You can have this pink metal right here, which is called ceramic, on ceramic right here. And then you can have ceramic on plastic, which actually is this one right here, ceramic on plastic right here. Now again, the same holds true. If one particular bearing surface was truly, truly superior, again, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh, everybody would be using it. But they each have their advantages, they each have their disadvantages, and in certain patients, I'll use one, and in other patients, I'll use another. You know, it all depends on uh, what that particular patient's needs are. So that's a conversation that you have to have with your doc one-on-one, -on -one, and, and they, they will address it. Uh, at that point. So, um, once, once someone has decided to have uh, hip surgery, uh, you know, a lot of questions that I get, you know, what's going to be involved, when do I come into the hospital, what happens afterwards, and I touched upon some of this already, but we'll just go over it again briefly. You come into the hospital the day of your surgery, um, you were admitted that day, you know, back back in the old days, again, yes, you used to have to come to the hospital before, the night before your surgery, and there's a lot of things that they'd have to do. Now you come in the day of your surgery. Uh, physical therapy starts the day of or the morning after. We get you out of bed and moving around. And, and again, the length of stay is anywhere from one to three days, depending on the patient's needs. Um, most of the patients, probably close to about 70% of the patients, are able to go home after their hip surgery especially if they have some help at home. Um, occasionally, if we have uh, frequent questions that I'll get, is uh, what if I live at home uh, by myself? You know, what, what should I do in that situation? And so what I'll tell people is, you know, if you have any family members that they can come and stay with you for a week or so, or if you have any friends that you can stay with or if they can stay with you, I think that's the ideal situation. If that is not the, if that is not the situation, then you may need to go to like an extended care facility for a short while, for anywhere from one to two weeks, if necessary. Uh, and unfortunately, most of the time we can't make that decision until after the surgery, until we see how you're doing and 
how you're progressing so that we know where you can be uh, sent to after your surgery. But again, about 70% of the patients probably end up going home after surgery. Uh, when can I drive? Uh, if you're having surgery on your left hip, as soon as you feel comfortable getting in and out of a car and you're not taking any pain medication, you can drive. If you're having surgery on your right hip, uh, average patient will take probably anywhere from two to seven weeks or so to be able to drive. Uh, and you know, some people recover a little bit faster than others. And of course, you can't be taking pain medication while you're driving. Uh, how much pain will I have? Uh, after hip surgery, really, pain is not a huge complaint for patients. And in fact, as we said before, uh, pain is resolved after the surgery. People will tell me they're sore, but most patients are not requiring to you know, extensive amounts of pain medications after the surgery. Um, so, uh, how do I know when I should have my hip replaced? Uh, this, is a, this is a difficult question, uh, and only, I tell patients, only you know when you're going to have your hip replaced. But what I'll tell people a lot of times is don't make your hip make you old, or your knee for that matter. If you find that you are if you find that, I see someone nudging someone here. Uh, if you find that your hip or your knee is really precluding you from doing the things you want to be doing, and you're basically foregoing life so that you don't have to live in pain, then you really need to be considering a hip or knee replacement. If you're avoiding going shopping, avoiding going on trips with your family or traveling because you're worried about your hip or knee, it might be a good time to think about doing something about it. And so when it really starts impacting your quality of life and the pain is not tolerable, then you, then I strongly encourage people to consider a hip surgery. Uh, frequently, other, other frequently asked question is, you know, what am I forgetting to ask you? Or, you know, why should I have my hip replaced at St. Joe's? Um, I think we have a great orthopedic program at St. Joe's. We have uh, an orth dedicated orthopedic floor with physical therapists that know what they're doing. We have a gym on the orthopedic floor that the therapists utilize. Um, we do it a lot, so we're good at it. Uh, that Those are the keys. Uh, the other nice thing is, you know, we got all, you know, it's a beautiful, you know, the venue is beautiful, the place is beautiful. You have nice patient rooms, which are all private, uh, with good care and excellent nursing. So I think those are the keys when you're thinking about where you want to have your hip surgery done. Is you want to have it done somewhere where they do a lot of it, they've got uh, talented people around it. You know, the doctor, the surgeon, the hip surgeon, myself, uh, is one component of it. But, you know, it's a really a, it's a team effort with uh, the nurses on the hospital floor, the physical therapist. You know, all these people have to be performing. So uh, I'm one component of it, but I'm involved in all the components. So. The, the patients see me every day after surgery. I, you know, at, at the hospital, I come and see them in the morning. Uh, the nurses uh, are there, uh, and everybody's there to help take care of the patients, uh, so that we ensure that they've had a successful hip or knee replacement surgery. But you know, I think those are the keys. So, um, let's see. So that is the official end of my uh, presentation for you. And uh, again, I will open it up uh, to uh, questions. And I'll be able to answer any of your questions that you have. And then afterwards, you know, please, please feel free. You can ask me questions personally as well. And, and you know, you should check out some of these implants. They're kind of interesting to uh, feel and look at. Thank you.